Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Hackney Empire. This is NHS in Stitches. Stand up for the NHS. Please welcome your host and compare, Wendy Wayson! to inspire and delight and encourage you to fight for our glorious NHS. Are you ready for a great night of comedy tonight, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah. Excellent. Let's welcome to the stage your first act for this evening, the tremendous, the fantastic Mr. Stuart Lee! Ah, hey. oh, what a week it's been, eh? You can't even punch someone repeatedly in the face while delivering a tirade of racist abuse without the <laughs> loony left coming down on you. <laughs> Political correctness gone mad. Uh, but it is nice to be out here. Uh, I hate uh, being at home. Um, there's <laughs> annoying things happen to me. Like last Sunday morning at uh, half past five, there was a knock at my door and I went down and answered it. And there was one of these door-to-door, uh, -door, born again, sort of evangelist types there. And he said to me, sir, the answer is Jesus, now what is the question? Uh, and I said, is the question for which role was Robert Powell... <laughs> ..nominated for a BAFTA? <laughs> and uh, he said, no, it isn't that. It's not that question. I said, can I have another go? He said, yes. <laughs> I said, is the question born in zero BC? I am commonly regarded as being the inventor of Christianity. Which J am I? <laughs> and he said, no, it isn't that. I said, can I have another guess? He said, yes. I said, is it a question, complete the name of this popular early 1970s item of hippie fashion footwear, <laughs> the blank sandal? <laughs> He said, no, it isn't that. I said, can I have another guess? <laughs> he said, yes. I said, is the question... Complete the name... He said, you're staying with the... Complete the name format, I notice. <laughs> I said, that's right, you initiated this... Combat, I reserve the right... To choose the ground upon which it is for. <laughs> I said, is the question... Complete the name of this influential... But <laughs> early 1980s Scottish <laughs> post punk band, The Blank and Mary Chain. <laughs> uh, and he said, I'll warn you, he said, if you're considering doing this routine. 25 years after you first performed it at the Hackney Empire. <laughs> There's every chance, he said, that band will have fallen from recognition and a routine that's been building nicely will plateau out at that point. And I said to him, well, it's, it's kind of you to point out, I said to him, this is the same routine as I did here in 1990. But I, there are two factors working against it. Not, the, first of all, the demographic reach of the people, I think, will mean that they, they re remember that band. And also, uh, the way things are going, there's every chance they'll be in a reunion tour by the time... <laughs> the, uh, so, you know, I'm not, I'm not worried. I think it will... Uh, it'll be fine. Um, and he said, well, just, you know, bear that in mind and try... It's a short seven to eight minute slot, try not to get bogged down in an improvisation. Uh, you know, you're your own worst enemy. I said, well... You know, I like to give the flavour of, uh, of spontaneity, even within a very tightly corralled slot. He said, well, you know, it's a risk, isn't it? You run the risk of... Uh, there being a minority of the audience enjoying it, but on the whole... So that minority will build, you know, if you, uh, <laughs> if you stick with it. Mm. It'll build spasmodically, you said, but it'll... There'll be peaks, there'll be a woman shrieking in the stalls. <laughs> but you run the risk of it just spinning off into 
just awkwardness, which is not something... I said, I said, I'm not worried about that. I said, even you saying the word awkwardness, I think, could... No, it has gone, it's gone now. <laughs> I said, can I have another guess? He said, yes, I think you need to. I said, is the question complete the name? He said, not that again. I said, yeah. Is the question complete the name of this largely forgotten late 1980s Chicago proto-grunge band, The Blank Lizard? Uh, and he said, I don't know, I've not heard of them. <laughs> and I said, surely it's obvious what they're called by now. <laughs> and he said to me, you obviously think it's very clever to be sarcastic, don't you? And I said, no. <laughs> and he said, you do, you were doing it then. I said, no, I wasn't. <laughs> if anything, you were. So, none of that really happened. I, um... <laughs> the guy did... It sort of happened. The guy did come round to my door and he did say the answer is Jesus. Now, what is the question? But I didn't say any of that stuff. I just went, uh, oh, I'm not interested, really. <laughs> and then I went back to bed. And then, about 18 hours later, when I woke up, I thought of all the hilarious things I could have said. <laughs> I think it's really important, sort of philosophical point, that, you know, in the, after the war, uh, there was a sudden realisation from the uh, establishment that uh, ordinary people had put their lives at risk for the, for, the, uh, for the security of the country, and that were stakeholders in it, rather than sort of pigs to be farmed for its benefit. They were, they were stakeholders in it, and that the state ought to take an interest in them. And, and the health service goes back to that idea, and I think it's a core idea of... Um, what it means to live in a civilised society, that we have a responsibility to each other and people with more contribute to a system whereby they're looked after and that uh, system should probably not be run for profit. Yeah. Even if you can say the, the little amounts of profit are very small, I still think the philosophy behind it should be that in a civilised society the state should have an interest in the well-being of its, of its people. And I know that there's all sorts of issues at the moment about the population are living longer, uh, there's a birth rate explosion, how are we going to cover the cost of this? Um, but that isn't what the, 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 the uh, uh, philosophical objections to the health service at the moment are about the free market versus the responsibility of the state. And we have to cut right to the core of that and not get bogged down in other arguments and hang on to the fundamental belief that it's an important thing. Please welcome your next act to the stage, Mr Nish Kumar! Good evening, well-meaning lefties! Hello! Good to be amongst my people. Uh, it's nice to be here, ladies and gentlemen. Obviously, this is a very important cause. It's one uh, particularly that I feel close to because uh, I actually had to use the NHS a couple of weeks ago. I was uh, doing the washing up and a glass exploded and it slashed my hand here. And I had to go to hospital. The NHS staff were amazing. One of them called me a brave boy. Uh, <laughs> Which is good, because I was being one, so I don't know why you're all laughing now. But before I did that, I did something that I would urge none of you to do. I found NHS 111. Now, yeah, if you don't know what this is, it is a entirely not stupid system that the government have brought in to replace NHS Direct. So if you have a non-life-threatening emergency, you're supposed to dial 111. Now, I'm sure that these people are very nice, but based on my experience, they have proportionately less skill and knowledge than their numerical value compared to 999, because <laughs> it was the blind leading the blind. At one point she went, how is the blood? I went, red, I've got no idea. And she went, is there a lot of blood? I said, yes, because there was a lot of blood. She went, is there enough to fill a mug? <laughs> I've got no idea. I don't wish to brag, but I have a lot of different mug sizes in my house. Also, while this is happening, I am just panicking. I'm not decanting the blood <laughs> in the hope it can be poured back at a later date. And then she said, is the blood flowing or oozing? And I was like, I don't know what the difference is between those two things. And she went, oh, there's a difference. <laughs> I'm not getting into a semantic debate with you while blood is gushing out of my hand. And she went, gushing, thank you very much. <laughs> 
That's all we needed. Uh, good evening. Hello. Yes, you are correct. The acts are getting even darker. Now, <laughs> last year was very busy for me. In uh, February, for the first time in my career, I flew out to do some shows in L.A. <laughs> uh, that's uh, Lower Acton. And um, <laughs> in, uh, in April, I went over to do some shows in Bahrain in the Middle East. Anybody here ever been out of the Middle East? Yeah. Okay, a couple of people. I was surprised at how hot it was over there. I woke up. At 8.30 in the morning, I step out the hotel, it is 43 degrees. I'd never known he'd like it. I'm standing there wearing a pair of shorts and a T-shirt. I was crying for my mum. <laughs> One of the porters comes and goes, what is the matter? And he goes, it's so hot. <laughs> Why is it so bloody hot? He goes, no, it's just 43 degrees. It's a breeze. In the summer, I get to 50 degrees, 55 degrees. We have freckly ginger people just exploding all over the place. <laughs> I had never known heat like it. I was over there for five days. Before I went there, I was white, OK? <laughs> I left Bahrain darker than my shadow. <laughs> it was so hot over there that every time I masturbated, I would ejaculate steam. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you've got a great show. Take care, start listening. God bless, good night. Thank you. Well, this should be one of the proudest documents in the history of this country. This is it, the... Uh, document hailing the foundation of our National Health Service, that no longer do people have to uh, pay money to see a doctor, a nurse, to be treated, but that it's there all of a sudden on the basis of their needs. It's a very proud moment in the history of this country, and we should celebrate this sort of document maybe more than we do at the moment. We're not spending enough on health at the moment. Not since the foundation of the NHS has this squeeze in funding been so acute and at the worst possible time. You know, it doesn't make any sense at a time when the NHS needs to be working harder to force through all this chaos. Those who tell us there isn't the money there to properly fund and resource our NHS, well, they've got a political agenda. Austerity is a great opportunity for politicians to push through policies they always wanted to introduce, but they didn't think they'd get away with it. But at a time of crisis, well, then you can start to say, well, the crisis justifies exceptional policies and these are the policies we're going to drive through. The privatisation of our NHS is a classic example of that. And when they say our NHS is too expensive, have a look across the Atlantic. They've got a privatised healthcare system which doesn't meet people's needs, which leaves millions of people without healthcare, and they spend far more money on their healthcare system. Well, they have to, don't they? Because it's partly in terms of profit margins. These companies have to make money. But it's so fragmented and complex, you have to have this massive bureaucracy to oversee it. So actually, a cheap, efficient way is through our National Health Service. And the research backs this up. We have an efficient healthcare system compared to fragmented, privatised system. So why on earth are we going down the road of privatisation and fragmentation, given how inefficient those healthcare systems are? It doesn't make any sense. Are you angry yet? You should be. You should be as angry as Jeremy Clarkson faced with a cold meat platter. <laughs> Please welcome the next act. She's a fantastic comic. You'll love her. I love her. Miss Lucy Porter! I'm debating what I'm going to do on stage tonight because I am not a political comedian and I have never really talked about my personal politics in my act, but increasingly I am just because it is an obsession that I think a lot of my friends are sort of... We're becoming increasingly radicalised. Yeah, yeah, in the right way. In the right... Not, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Not, yeah. I'm not flying to Turkey, but, yeah, the, uh, yeah we are. I let myself sort of slide from being politically active. And I think, you know, I, I'm not saying I've slid to the right. I know people always say it's a bit of a cliche that you get more right wing as you get older. I don't think I have got more right wing. I think I just sort of realised that being left wing is a lot more effort. Because, um, do you know what I mean? It's like if you, even if you're quite moderately left wing like I am now, you know, you have to do, you have to do, like I went on the demo for the NHS, you know, there's always a petition to sign, there's like a bake sale for Venezuela, can you come up with something gluten free by Tuesday, you know, and it's a, 
but, it, but it's worth it. This is what I'm, re I'm increasingly going, yeah, it's worth it. Because, I mean, you know, it is easier being right-wing. If you're sort of, you know, a Tory, you just have to sit at home reading the Daily Telegraph, occasionally pen a strongly worded letter to the BBC. But, you know, although obviously not if you're very right-wing, then it starts to become an effort again because there's boots to be polished, uniforms to be starched, you know. But... Uh, <laughs> I kind of think it, it's specifically the NHS as, a, as an issue is something that I really can't ignore. And I have sought to become better informed. Again, politically, I've let my, uh, my sort of level of knowledge slide. Because I used to know, like, up until my 30s, I would say, I always knew, like, you know how when you're younger, you always know what's in the charts. Even if you don't like chart music, you always go, well, I know what's number one. And similarly with politicians, I always used to know who was in the cabinet, the shadow cabinet. Whereas now, people are like, oh, what do you think of Ed Sheeran? And I'm like... Shadow cabinet, is he? <laughs> They're all Eds, aren't they? You know, Lady Gaga, Tory leader of the house. <laughs> Sam Smith, that nice lady who's in charge of the Greens. You know, I, I don't really know. But I think because, you know, the NHS is obviously such a vital issue to all of us. And because, I, I mean, I have had two children recently on the NHS, amazing UCLH. And the, the gratitude that I feel when I had my babies, it was a bit complicated because my husband's a bit different to me. I'm four foot 11, Justin is six foot five. So, yeah, it's, it's in the bedroom, it's like a ventriloquist mat that's gone to a very dark place, essentially. But uh, <laughs> don't dwell on this. It sort of looks like he's wearing a novelty pencil. Anyway, no, it doesn't matter. But. <laughs> But, you know, and it was... I, I was like, God, this is scary. You know, for the first time I was, like... Because the doctors were like, this is going to be... This is like a medical experiment, basically. What happens if you cross, cross a cart horse with a Shetland pony? And uh, it turns out you get cart horses. My children are massive, right? They're, they're only three and four, but they're already enormous. They're, like, you know how you have to start moving things up onto higher shelves as kids get older? I can now no longer reach the cleaning fluids in my own home. <laughs> Bastards. Come on, give me a wave. Bring back some happy memories. <laughs> I'm told you're all here to save the NHS. Save the NHS? Is that thing still going? Cameron should have flogged it off to some Guatemalan hedge fund ages ago. If he hasn't got the balls, I'll chop some off for him. I'm good at that. In fact, he can have mine. And the other bit, too. Who needs genitals when you've already fucked the country? <laughs> Keep up the good work. The Health and Social Care Act was passed in March 2012. The aim is to replace the NHS with an insurance-based US-style system. Government duty to provide universal health care has been scrapped. Clinical commissioning groups have been set up and forced to tender all NHS services. Private companies can now run any NHS service. 49% of our NHS resources can be used to treat private patients creating one queue for the rich and one for the poor. The act was fiercely opposed by the medical profession and NHS workers. They knew what the act would lead to. A risk assessment commissioned by the government and leaked to the press warned we might lose our comprehensive service, that the act would lead to widening health inequalities, reduction in quality of care and increased costs. But you can't read that because the government defied a court order under the Freedom of Information Act and refused to publish it. Despite these warnings, the act was voted into law. The changes that it forced through have cost billions, money that has been diverted from patient care. Medical staff have been made redundant and the remainder have had their wages frozen. Services are being broken up, making it harder for medical professionals to share resources and work together but easier for private companies to pick off profitable services, leaving the unprofitable ones to wither. Hospitals are being starved of funds, run down and closed, or handed over to private companies. Communities have been fighting back. Lewisham took the government to court to save their hospital and won. So the government changed the law All over the UK, 
people are standing together for the founding principles of the NHS. They are making a difference. Although private healthcare providers now earn more than a quarter of their income from the NHS, they say the pace of privatisation has proved disappointing. Our NHS is the fairest, most cost-effective and cost-efficient healthcare system in the world. Because it was created for need, not profit. For patients, not shareholders. Tom? I'm Ben. I'm Matthew. Together we are Pappies. Yes, Hello. we're going to do some sketches for you, but before we get into the sketches, how about we relax into things a little bit by playing a game? How do you feel about that? Yeah. yeah, in fact, why don't we play my favourite game in the whole world? Why don't we play Guess Who? Oh. All right, yeah. OK, uh, does he have long hair? No. Oh, is it Tom? Yes, yes oh, it is me! Straight off the bat. Incredible! Incredible! My turn, my turn! Does he wear glasses? Yes. Is it Matthew? hey -o. I don't know how I do it. Good stuff. I've got one, I've got one. Uh, did he once, as a little treat for his girlfriend, shave off all of his pubic hair? Yes. I'll tell you what, let's not play this game. Let's just... Uh, oh, come on. No, let's move on straight on with the sketches. We're wasting time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, double-click, double-click keyboard. Oh, double-click, double-click keyboard. <laughs> Ooh, laptop, laptop, Wi-Fi, hotspot. What's the username? Check the server. <laughs> Working hard, getting bored, get distracted. Google, Google something naughty. Not safe for work, clear history. <laughs> Get back down to work printing, printing, but the program is not responding. Your work was not say bullshit, bullshit, control, alt, delete, yes. Yes, uh, there's, yes, there's no time for that sketch that we like to call the computer hacker. <laughs> Good morning, sir. Welcome to Brand's Pet Projects. How can I help you? Well, uh, I wish to register a complaint. Sorry, we're closed. Never mind all that, my lad. It's about this here. This here welfare system we established not 70 years ago. The NHS? What's wrong with it? I tell you what's wrong with it, you buff on Nancy boy. It's dead. <laughs> That's what's wrong with it. It's dead. And I want my £113 billion back. No, it isn't. Look at it. It's a glorious ideal that sets us apart from the rest of Europe. <laughs> the ideal don't come into it. It's dead. And if it's not dead, it's definitely on its last legs. No, it's pining for a lack of funding. Pining for lack of funding? Look, matey, this NHS is as disappointing as a diabetic Willy Wonka. Its vital signs are fading. Its organs are packing up faster than Nigel Farage at the Notting Hill Carnival. It's now about as much use as Captain Hook in a gynaecology ward. He's had so many transplants, we've run out of donors. We've taken it off dialysis, we've read it its last rites, and if it were any more dead, we'd have to call it the Bleeding Labour Party. This is an ex-health service. So, cutting it to the core, kicking it continually, and using it as a political football is the answer, is it? Well, uh, I suppose I could find a replacement project. What have you got? Well, all right. What about the incendiary tumescence that is Trident? Or the unashamed pilfering of the bulging banks? All corporate tax evasion are so blatant, they might as well be singing pick a pocket or two like an over-theatrical fagin. <laughs> Theatrical? Hmm, now there's a thought. Clegg, stop flogging that dead horse. Get me Alan Davy on the phone. 
Those sponging weirdos at the Arts Council have had it easy for too long. <laughs> oh, I really need to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> Our culture is still so scared of difference, isn't it? Like, I think diversity is beautiful, but, you know, I'm in the minority. Of, like, people are so nervous about it. Like, this is awful. But I heard recently that most couples in Britain still choose to have an abortion when they find out their baby will be disabled. So, it really is great to be here. <laughs> Thanks, all. Uh, no, look. Oh, don't worry, I'm not judgmental, I get it. It's a complex issue, isn't it? And no one wants an unhealthy baby. And if I'm honest, I may consider it one day. You know, I can imagine sitting at my doctor's being told, I'm really sorry, but your baby boy does carry the defective gene and he will be a Tory politician! <laughs> Oh my God! Are you sure? <laughs> and she'll say, yes, we've located the privatisation gene, <laughs> the cutting welfare gene, and the smarmy bastard gene. <laughs> and I'll say, but how do you know he won't be Liberal Democrat? <laughs> I'm waiting for the time for the public to rise up about this because when I talk to people, they say, oh, the NHS, they can't touch that. And I'm like, no, they have. It's happened. And people can't seem to quite believe that it's possible for this great institution to be eroded. I love working in A&E. It's a very interesting place. We see a lot of patients. We diagnose, we treat, we discharge, all within four hours most of the time. And if we can't discharge them, we admit them. So we have inpatients as well as outpatients. A lot happens in an A&E. We resuscitate, we anesthetize, we perform surgery, we even deliver babies. And often, we are the place of last resort for the most vulnerable in our society. So when you hear about plans to downgrade an A&E, it's all these things that are being jeopardized. A downgraded A&E doesn't deal with any blue light emergencies. It has no resuscitation facilities whatsoever. It only admits low risk patients for short periods of time. A downgraded A&E doesn't have an intensive care unit. It doesn't offer acute surgery or a doctor led maternity unit. It doesn't have acute medicine wards or pediatric wards. It doesn't have a lot of things. But there's more at stake. An A&E is a vital training ground for a whole host of NHS staff. Medical and nursing students, trainee surgeons, anaesthetists, GPs. None of these can do core parts of their training in a downgraded A&E. They have to leave. And that means fewer and fewer doctors and nurses throughout the NHS with training in emergency care. Those in charge of the downgrading claim that hacking out, subcontracting or selling off parts of the NHS is no big deal. They say it will simply force people to visit their GPs. But we don't have enough GPs. They are already overworked and demoralised. And most importantly, they're not equipped to deal with emergencies the way an A&E does. So where will the patients go? Please, please put your hands together and welcome to the stage, Mr. Mark Steele.
you know what? This is a question about the NHS and about so many other things. Where's the money gone? We used to have money in this country for shit like that, but now they go, oh, we can't afford it. We can afford it in the 1920s. We could have all fire engines and libraries and schools. But it's gone now. We can't... Where's it gone, the money? And then they've got an answer for where the money's gone. I'll tell you who's got it. Who's nicked it all? The poor. That's who's got it. <laughs> They're the ones who've got, they've swiped it, they've taken it all, the poor, look at them, roll, look at them tramps, rolling it, covered in gold, they've got it all. We can't take it back off the rich, they haven't got two eight to rub together, they're skin. It's the poor who've got it all, all of it. It's like every day you get articles in the newspaper saying things like, what about that woman in a council estate in Cardiff? Have you seen about her? 137 kids she's got, every single one of them on benefits, every single one. Now they've brought a giraffe and the giraffe's on benefits. And... <laughs> And now they've said that the giraffe's getting a crick neck because the ceiling's too low. So, so the, the council's put them up in St Paul's Cathedral. And, and now one of the kids has got compulsive snooker syndrome. So, so now the, the state has given them a full-size snooker table, but the mother says she can't be referee because she's allergic to white gloves. So the mayor comes round and counts up all the points for him, otherwise he'll be put in jail by Europe. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> Every day shit like this. The poor, that's good to the poor and immigrants. Immigrants, there the one. Look at them, nine of them living in a shed. They've got all the money. <laughs> immigrants, people voting for UKIP because they're crapping themselves. It's no wonder, is it? People are thinking, oh, luck, because of the papers. Every day, politicians, they say things like, 30 million Bulgarians now can come to this country. 30 million any day. 30 people are shitting themselves, aren't they? They think, one day I'll open the door to go in the garden. The door's shut. I can't get out. I can't get those bloody Bulgarians. There's millions of them. I can't get out. <laughs> Nor we all live here now. Nothing you can do. We're all in garden now. <laughs> I can't. Who is this? Dad, this is Dimitrov. His head is stuck in cat flap. Nothing you can do. Here. <laughs> Lisbon Treaty say you must leave him there now. Come every day. Feed with saucer. Milk. Give him every day. <laughs> Because that's the official attitude towards immigration now in this country, is I'll tell you what your immigrants do. This is what happens with immigrants, right? Is they, like, they, they run off from Somalia or one of them places where they've all got Ebola or something like that, right? And then they, they walk across Africa, right? They climb in a barrel, they float to Spain, right? They travel across Europe on the back of a truck in a crate full of piglets, cling to the side of an hovercraft, come over here, then we're supposed to look after these people who are prepared to make an effort. That's what happens. <laughs> that's what happens. Gone, all the money is gone, it's gone. It's, it used to be, it used to be you'd think, right, well, I, I, whatever else happens in life, I'll be all right, they'll look after me, there'll be a council house or something, whatever, the worst thing, pension, something. But now you're skint from the day you're born, and if you go to university, you owe about 50 grand and you've got to pay that off while you're saving up for a house because there's nothing else left and pensions there all gone. And you get these people on the, the news and the, the radio programs and stuff, and they'll say, experts on finance, they say, we've got to get used to the fact that nowadays we need, even when we're in you know, the middle of our working lives, to be putting a little bit more, put a little bit more aside every month for a pension. We've got to think about it a bit more. As if people have got a bit more. <laughs> people must be sitting listening to this thinking, oh, right, that's where I put all my extra money, is it? I've been wondering what to do with all the extra money. <laughs> it's been driving me mental. There's no way I've got, I can't get around the house. There's fucking money. I can't get out. <laughs> I'll be going to the zoo and feeding it to tigers. What extra money? <laughs> and they ring in and go, oh, I don't really have anything extra. They say, well, we can all make sacrifices. Maybe you've got children. Why not abandon them to the forest? <laughs> And then they'll say, even when you're about 18, 19, as soon as you start working your first job, really you should be already thinking about putting a little bit aside for your pension right from the early age at 18 or 20, putting money aside. What sort of a miserable teenager? <laughs> How much of a fucking useless excuse of a wank-headed, shitty, fucking, <laughs> piss-faced, teenage pile of fucking rubbish do you have to be to put money aside for a pension when you're fuck off if you're even thinking about it? Fuck off! <laughs> How dare you even think about that at 20? What a waste! Bruv, you're coming down like uh, the club tonight. It's your favourite DJs you get me. 
No, I'm going to put that entrance money aside into my ISA account, you see. <laughs> You see, you might think you're having more fun in life, but when we're 74, I'm going to be the one who can afford to stay in Weatherspoons for another 10 minutes for another pay of fuck off. <laughs> I suppose the health service is, in a way, the, the sort of best example of the, the arguments that there have been over the last few years about how society should be run, in Britain or around the world, should it be run in such a way that a few people can make a profit. Indeed, that seems to be the way that loads of people now think that's the only way something can run. If, it's, if there's not someone making money out of it, the thing will just dissolve like it's some sort of law of physics. Uh, or should it be run because, well, this, is, this seems to be the best way of, of running it, not just making a profit, but for everybody equally. And the health service is, is the most obvious example of something that clearly not only is much more efficient if it's run collectively with everybody paying in an amount that they can afford and people using it as and when they need it uh, and and not just in order to make someone very rich and most people in Britain accept that and go yes of course that's a brilliant and it should you know and, all the arguments that you get about everything else. You, well, if something, if someone isn't making a profit, then it simply isn't going to work, or people will just steal off it, things like that. You know, they'll go and take more than they need. People will just go to the hospital every week and say, I need a kidney operation. It's free, I might as well have it. I'm an idiot not to have a, a liver out. It's free! Get in and get your liver out! They do it for nothing. Of course people don't do that. I don't think, anyway. <laughs> But where's it gone to? That's it now. Everything, everything now. It's got to be, oh, you've got to have business people coming in, health service, everything. Everything's got to be paid for, profit, everything. Every little thing. And it encourages all the worst in people, doesn't it? All the, but why should I pay? Why should I pay for the, for the health service? I'm not ill, those people. Why should I pay for a library? I don't go to the library. Why, I'm, not, I'm not on fire. If you want to be on fire, you pay for the fire engine. <laughs> Everything like that. Lamp posts soon. They'll have little meters in. You'll put 5p in the lamp post. It'll give you just enough light to get to the next one. <laughs> Why should I pay? Why should I pay for your light? I was indoors. I've got my own torch. <laughs> oh, well, thanks very much, Ernie. Thanks very much for coming along. You'll be marvelous. <laughs>